don't tell me the score. Have you ever recorded a sporting event and you're on your way home and you want to make sure you can watch it like where nobody ruins it at all? You're going in like anybody that walks up to you, you go, don't tell me the score, right? Somebody calls you on the phone. You don't say hello. You say, don't tell me the score. Like you walk in the house, you go, don't tell me the score, right? Last year during the football season, the Bucks were playing on a Monday night or a Thursday night or something. And I had something at church and I was getting home late. But the game was recorded, and anyone who called on the phone heard, don't tell me the score. I walked in the house, don't tell me the score, and I sit down and I start the game. But here's the thing. I didn't want anybody to tell me the score, anybody to tell me the outcome. But as the game got tense, as it got stressful, as my nerves got frayed, I started wanting to know what the score was going to turn out to be, right? Because the stress of that moment, like you wanted to know what the outcome was. And even though I'd sworn my family to secrecy, I could read their faces, And so as the game started to turn southward and as it started to go worse and worse, I could see on their face, I'm not going to like the outcome of this very much, right? From, From my perspective, they knew the future. And from my perspective, while I was stressed in that moment, I know it's just a game, let me go. They're playing at one. I'm nervous about it. It's coming out right now. We don't beat the Saints in the regular season, but that's a whole nother thing, okay? As I'm watching the game, I start to get stressed. But what I do is I look to the people who know the outcome in order for me to know what my outlook should be. They knew the future, at least my future. I didn't. But looking into the face of the people who knew how it was going to turn out shaped my outlook. Now, that night it did not turn out very well, believe it or not. But here's the thing I want you to catch. Throughout Scripture, there are moments, there's huge sections of God's Word that are dedicated to communicating God's future, God's plan to God's people. Those books, those writings are called prophecy. About 25 to 30% of the Bible deals with prophecy, where God in one moment in time is declaring through his prophets what's going to happen in another moment in time. A lot of those prophecies have been fulfilled. Some of them have not yet been fulfilled. But in in those works of prophecy, we get to see a God that exists above and beyond time, that he created time and is not subject to that, and that he is a plan that extends beyond the end of beginning of Genesis in that direction. It extends beyond the amen of Revelation in that direction. And he has a plan that is going to come to fruition. And it's not a plan that he's making up as he goes. He is not calling audibles at the line of scrimmage. He knows exactly how it's all going to work out before one event ever happens within his creation. So here's the reality. The big idea we're going to look at, one of those sections of prophecy in Scripture is a book called Isaiah. And you've seen from the bumper video, you've seen we're going to be diving into that book over the next several weeks, looking at the good news, the gospel foretold in this ancient prophetic writing. But we're starting today, and we're starting this series from this big idea and this premise, and here it is, that knowing the outcome changes your outlook. If I rode home that night knowing that the Bucks were going to lose, I'd go, oh, well, the Bucks are going to lose. If I rode home that night knowing the Bucks were going to win, I'd be relaxed no matter how stressful the game got. Why? Because I already knew the outcome. And there's something about God's writing, of prophetic writing, of, of foretelling what's going to come in God's big story that can bring great peace to the people who are hearing that in the midst of trying times. Through these books of prophecy, God is revealing himself and making himself known to his people. Notice what one author said about prophecy. He said, the eternal God knows the end of history from the beginning and has revealed the future to his servants, the prophets. The prophets. Now, prophecy is often about foretelling. Here's something that's going to happen later, but that's not the only thing that's in those prophetic books. It's also about foretelling. There's foretelling events, but then there's also foretelling of truth. And the book of Isaiah has both. It vividly calls out the sins of God's people, talks about the consequences of what's going to happen to them if they don't turn from their wicked ways. It even, though, gives detailed predictions about what's to come in God's big plan, about what's to come in God's big story, to the point where just one case in point here is that a hundred years before he was even born, the prophet Isaiah names a man by the name of Cyrus who would end up being a king of a people called the Persians, and he ends up being the deliverer of God's people, letting them letting them go from their captivity in a foreign land. A hundred years before his parents even named him, God, through Isaiah, wrote down that man's name and the role that he would fill. Now, in all those Old Testament books, Isaiah's got a lot of those prophets, a lot of those prophecies. Many of them have been fulfilled. But within all of those Old Testament prophecies, within all those Old Testament books, within all those big 
those big books that are sometimes hard to read through when you get to them in the reading plan, here's what I want you to see. Isaiah is not just a book of calling out sin. Isaiah is not just a book of detailing God's plan in advance. It is probably the most gospel-soaked book in the Old Testament where the good news of Jesus that the hope that is to come in him is communicated over and over and over. In the 1,300 verses that we find in this book, we see the Messiah not only predicted, but the heart of the Father who sent his Son vividly displayed within those pages. And my hope and my prayer for us as a church, as we walk through this book over the next several weeks, that you and I will come to have our outlook on God and our outlook on life and our outlook on God's world and our outlook on our place in God's plan be radically reshaped by the God who knows how it's all going to turn out, by the God who knows the ways that we fall short, and yet the God who makes a way where there was no way and invites us into a life of purpose. Let's begin today by diving into the book of Isaiah, and we're going to begin by meeting the writer, the man named Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, who saw and oh, sorry, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Here we see in this first verse the introduction of the writer. He's a simple man from a singular time and place. A simple man when when the Bible talks about prophets, and sometimes when we read about prophets, we can kind of like set them in this other category. Like, like they're different people with different, I hate to use the word, but how we would use it in common vernacular now. It's like they have different powers than I would ever have. But that's not what's being communicated in Scripture. James, the brother of Jesus, when he's writing about Old Testament prophets, talking about Elijah, he says he was a man with a nature just like ours. He was just an ordinary guy. Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation, kind of a hint of in his name of what his purpose in life would be. He's a simple man, but he's also living in a singular time in a singular place that we can set him in history within the chronology of God's people. He's prophesying, speaking into the people in the nation of Judah. Now, if we talk about the the nation of Israel coming across the Jordan River, we talked about that last week, they come across the Jordan River into the promised land, they conquer the promised land, They establish a nation. There's generations where judges rule over them, and God is their king. But later on, they say, we want a king like all the other nations have. So they end up getting a king. His name is Saul. He's a bad king. And so God takes the throne from him and his family and gives it to a man who's a a man after God's own heart named David. And he becomes king of the united country. And then his son Solomon is king of the united country. It's a time of prosperity for the most part. They're able to get peace through war. God, God's able to protect them. There's really some beautiful truths of how God's providing for his people, but there comes a time after the death of Solomon where everything quickly falls apart and the nation divides to a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. Two tribes of Israel in the south, ten tribes of Israel to the north. So what we see is the southern kingdom is the nation of Judah. This had the city of Jerusalem as its capital, and we have this 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 writing, these prophecies from, the, from a man called Isaiah during the reign of four different kings, and it starts somewhere around 750 B.C., 750 years before Jesus was even born. What we see here as we start out this book is this, is that Isaiah was an ordinary man with an extraordinary calling. And we're going to see his calling next week. We're going to see what his calling looks like as, as, as we walk through the text today. But he is called by God to speak for God. He's called to be what's called in Scripture a prophet. And prophets simply conveyed the words of the words of God to the people of God. Now, Isaiah is the writer, but he's not the primary voice. He's actually conveying another voice. Look at verse 2. It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and have I brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox, the ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. See, the primary voice in this book is not Isaiah. Although Isaiah will speak sometimes, we'll hear him speak next week, recounting a scene from his life that's very powerful. But for the most part, the singular primary voice in the book of Isaiah is actually God's voice. 
It's Isaiah communicating and documenting what God had said to him. He starts with this idea of the Lord has spoken, that the prophets weren't offering their own commentary. They weren't hearing from God and then giving their version of it. The prophets simply documented what God declared. We've got to understand it that way in order to move forward in this. Here in chapter 1, God is speaking to his people, but he's calling heaven and earth to be the courtroom, to be the jury, to see what he's about to indict his people about. And all of creation, I believe, is shocked to hear that God's children have rebelled and rejected their creator. That the nation that God called out from all the other peoples on earth have said, thanks, but no thanks, we want nothing to do with you. Every parent who's ever had a wayward child for a season or maybe for several years or decades, any parent that is ever worried that their children are going to wander from the truth and you're worried about where they're going to end up, if you've ever felt that way as a mom and dad, as a grandma and grandpa, you can hear the breaking of God's heart here in this passage is saying, I cared for you, I provided for you, and I love you. And yet you're wandering off and you're rebelling and you're rejecting me. Here we see God has raised his children and now now they've rebelled. Here we see that this is not the first time this has happened. This is not going to be the last time this has happened. We think about their wanderings in the wilderness like we talked about last week, how they ended up wandering for 40 years. Why? Because they doubted God and rejected him. God's chosen people, they'd, they'd chosen to, to reject him. He had provided, and they had provoked. Those verses end with a phrase of utterly estranged, estranged. And it's not really a phrase we'd use very often, but let me unpack for you how, how one version sort of translates that phrase, and it's really kind of powerful. It says this, my people have walked out on me, their God. They've turned their back on the Holy One of Israel. They've walked off and never looked back. Now, it would be wrong to look to the book of Isaiah and to think we're the audience for that. The audience for the book of Isaiah is actually the ancient people of Israel. But it's God communicating to his creation, so there's, we have to understand what it meant to them and then apply it to our lives from there. But we've also got to recognize this, that the situation within the nation of Israel, within them collectively, within their hearts individually, is not something that's unique to them either. Here we see that this is the universal human condition, that apart from the saving work of Christ, we are all in the exact same spot that these people are, being utterly estranged from God. In Romans 3.23, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, that this is the universal human condition apart from God interceding and making a way. Those are verses you're familiar with. Let me lean into it even more. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Not one. Now, I've met some people who I think are really good people. And I've met a few people who weren't really good people. But I've never met anybody who was perfect. I certainly don't see that guy in the mirror every morning. We've all fallen short. There's not one of us who's been thoroughly righteous here on earth. There's not one of us who has done good at all times and all ways. There's not one of us who's never sinned. Even later on in the book of Isaiah, here's, here's what it says. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. We've all fallen short. We've all wandered away. We've all been sheep that did not listen to the shepherd and ran our own way and landed in trouble. That's who we are. That's the universal human condition apart from Jesus. Apart from Jesus, every human is utterly estranged from God. All humans have turned our backs. All humans have walked out. All humans have walked off and never looked back. That's the human sinful condition. Now, this reality, it sets the scenario for the entire book. This is sort of the preamble to the book of Isaiah. And it sets the scenario, it sets the reality for the rest of the book. There's, there's, throughout the rest of the book, there's going to be multiple portraits of Judah's sin. Throughout the book, there's going to be multiple predictions, multiple prophecies about the consequences that they were going to experience. Throughout the book, we're going to see really just how far sinful hearts can go and how desperately God wants those hearts to run back to him. Because God's people end up being rebels against God. And the nation of Judah was not just rebelling, they were redefining. Look at verse uh, 20, jumping over to chapter 5. Just real quick into chapter 5, we'll come back to 1. 
Chapter 5, verse 20 says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for, sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. You know, on the downward spiral into sin that every person here in this room has experienced to one degree or another, I know I have. This downward spiral into sin. Not everybody ends up going quite so far down as others, but everybody's been in this scenario for a moment. Here's, here's how it works. You start knowing something is wrong. Either everybody was told to you, but I believe like most things are written on our heart, we know they're right and wrong. Not all. We don't understand the intricacies of all things right and wrong, but I think there's some inherent natural law that's written on our hearts by a creator. We know something's wrong. But in that moment where we have the opportunity to do it, there's a moment where that thing we know that is wrong is at least for a second enticing. I look over there and it looks like fun. I look over there and it looks like joy. I look over there and it looks like pleasure. I look over there and it looks like fulfillment. I look over there and it feels like I'm missing out. But I don't do it because I know it's wrong. Then there's the next step. I know it's wrong. This time I do it anyway. I know it's wrong. I haven't rationalized myself and convinced myself it's actually right. In that moment, I know it's wrong, but my sin nature takes over. I listen to the lies of the enemy. I listen to the lies of my flesh, and I step in that direction and do the thing that I was not supposed to do. But in that moment, I feel awful about it. You feel broken about it, and you run to God, and you say, God, forgive me for what I've done. But here's the reality. Sometimes we do that thing we know that is wrong. We do it more than once. We do it more than twice. We do it so many times that there comes a point that not only are we doing something that we know is wrong, we don't feel bad about it anymore. We've grown so callous to that action, no longer does our heart feel soft and react and feel broken and go, oh my goodness, there's no guilt, there's no shame. You just keep doing it. You've gotten used to it. You can dig a little deeper in that spiral. You know what happens? You can get so callous to sin that you stop believing that it's wrong. And then something that I've seen in culture, it's probably not been totally absent in my life at times, but certainly in culture, you can reach a point where you are not only callous to it and it doesn't feel wrong anymore, you're not only okay with it and you've convinced yourself that it's not wrong anymore, you've gone so far as to say, you know what, I celebrate this thing that I used to think was wrong. You reach a point now where not only do I celebrate it, It'd be wrong of you not to celebrate it, too. Does it sound familiar? This book was written 2,700 years ago. And could these verses not be written about our modern culture today? Why? Because this is not an ancient issue, and it's not a modern issue. This is a human issue. This is the sin nature that comes from Adam and Eve who rejected God, rebelled against God, and shattered everything. And we've inherited it ever since. We are born into sin, and sin comes natural to us. That's the spiral. These verses are a perfect description of our times. Let me give you a for instance of how that's playing out in our culture today. A few years ago, uh, there was an effort by a professor at Old Dominion. His name is Alan Walker. Um, he's a professor of sociology and criminal justice, and he got global attention because he introduced a new term. You may remember this. I think it was in, 20, it was in 2021. He introduced this new term called minor attracted persons, or MAPs. You remember this? Minor attracted persons, or MAPs, for short, are within a greater argument that this, this professor was making, and, and I quote here from, from the article, pedophiles shouldn't be ostracized for their urges. His comments were, loud, were, were largely, and to a certain extent, loudly denounced at the time. On the news and certainly on social media, people said, this is crazy. We can't stand for this. This is too far. We're not going to allow that. This guy needs to be denounced. I think he ended up losing his job. I have a feeling he landed okay somewhere, though. Just this week, though, about a year ago it happened, just this week, there was a teacher in Texas, a high school teacher speaking to her class. They were having a conversation. I'm not sure of the context of the conversation. They were having a conversation about people who commit crimes against children in this way. And the, and the students were using the word pedophile. And there's an audio recording of the teacher saying this, stop it. We're not going to call them that. We're going to call them maps, minor attracted persons. 
So don't judge people just because they have urges towards five-year-olds. And I'll tell you, I cleaned up that last line. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Guys, the truth is this. We travel down the road to ruin one tiny step at a time. You guys familiar with a man by the name of Jordan Peterson? Professor, uh, author, speaker. Um, he's not a follower of Jesus by everything I can tell, but there's sometimes when I see him in interviews that I go, God's working on this guy. I wouldn't be shocked if he ended up getting saved at some point. But as I listen to him talk, I sort of have a mirror of like C.S. Lewis's story. It's a brilliant mind that struggled to surrender to the things of God and yet ended up doing it. God used him in a mighty way. I'm not putting him necessarily in the same category as C.S. Lewis. I'm not sure any mind that followed Christ ever has been, but I'd love to see Jordan Peterson surrender his life to Christ. But he has a very wise take on many things, and I want to share one of them with you, which is this topic right here. Here's, here's a quote from him. You're going to see it on the screen. He said this in an interview. He said, things get to terrible places one step at a time. If I encroach on you and I'm sophisticated about it, I'm going to encroach two millimeters, and I'm going to encroach right to the point where you start to protest, and then I'm going to stop, and then I'm going to wait, and then you're going to calm down. And then I'm going to encroach again right to the point where you protest. And then I'm going to stop. And then I'm going to wait. And I'm going to keep doing that forever. And before you know it, you're going to be back three miles from where you started, and you'll have done it one step at a time. And then you'll go, ah, how did I get here? And the answer is simple. I pushed you a little farther than you should have gone, and you agreed. You got to a terrible place one tiny step of, at a time, and you agreed to every single step. Does that describe our times pretty well? All right, now, press pause. Bear with me here. Here's what I want you to hear. There's something, hmm, uh, it's almost like halftime talk about hearing this. You go, yes, yes, we need to stand against culture, don't we? Do you feel that? Like, like you put your pads on, your helmets on, you're ready to walk out. Sorry for all the sports analogies. I'm, it's, it's football season, I can't. But here's what I want you to catch. Guys, hear this. This is really easy stuff to hear when you're thinking about what's happening in the world today. But here's what I want to ask you to do and what I'm asking myself to do. It's really easy to do that, but instead of looking out the window at others, let's look in the mirror at ourselves. Do you hear me? There is huge problems out in the world, and that is totally valid, and we need to understand it for that. But if that's where we stop, we miss the point of Isaiah. If that's where we stop, we miss the point of the gospel. Because what I want us to see is this. How do we, in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, how do we call good evil and evil good? How have we reached the point on this, that, or the other by sins of omission or sins of commission where we know what's right and we're not doing it, or we know what's right and we're doing the opposite? How have we called good evil and evil good? How do we know something is wrong we still do it anyways? How have we grown callous to sins that once caused us great guilt. There was a time where you never would have used that word. And now that word flies out without any repercussions at all, and you're stealing it out. You never would have watched that. Now you watch it like crazy, it doesn't bother you a bit. You never would have listened to something that said this. Now you listen to it all the time, and you know all the words like this. You never would have looked at somebody that's not your spouse that way, and now just a click away, and it's not a big deal to you anymore. But do you hear me? Man, I could get on my soapbox and stand and preach and just let loose on the culture all day long, and it'd be the best service ever, and we'd love it, right? But man, when we stop looking out the window and we look in the mirror, can we not go, Lord, this is me? How have you and I been walking down the road to ruin one tiny step at a time? Sin is universal human sickness. We all face it. We all deal with it. We inherit it from our parents. It's passed down mother to daughter, father to son. It's passed down through us. We are born into that. It's a universal human condition, and it gets us all throughout history and across cultures. We've seen that, people reacting to it. And, and you see religious systems develop among people to try and put a, put, a, put a pin on, put a fence around, try and contain the sinfulness of man. But is religion, to the, is the, is, is religion the answer? So what ails us? Look at chapter 1, verse 11, where Isaiah writes this from the Lord. What 
to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of or of lambs or of goats of, of, of goats. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Karl Marx called religion the, the opiate of the people to dull their senses and distract them from their from their painful lives. It's a quote used by secularists and socialists to denounce religion in all forms. And I, you can make a case in history that great evil has been done in the name of religion. You can also look through history and see that almost every good deed, every, almost every great good has been done in the name of religion as well. Religion is not the problem, and religion of, of its own, on its own, is not the only answer. You see, we're the problem. Human sin nature is the problem. And if we think religion is going to fix it on its own, religion in and of itself is going to fix it on its own, we're going to see very quickly that right, right actions from a wrong heart will never make us right with God. Right actions from the wrong heart are the wrong actions. Religion apart from worship is worthless. It's, it sort of looks like this. An absent parent walked away from the family not connected in any way, but this absent parent every year on the birthday sends a very expensive gift to his or her child. It's a nice action coming from the wrong heart, and it feels empty, right? That's what religious efforts by humans looks like to a God who can see right past the action to the heart, and he knows the heart is far from him, that the heart has rejected him, that the heart is rebelling against him. We can't fix ourselves with religion. Ancient offerings or modern church, if it doesn't come from a heart that's filled with worship and adoration and surrender, it's not the solution either. Sin problem is still there. So apart from Jesus, every human is utterly estranged from God. No amount of empty religion is ever going to be able to reconcile us to God. So you're like, man, I'm glad I came to church today. This is heavy stuff, isn't it? So now what? What do we do? Look at verse 16. Verse 16, God says to his people, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. God looks at his people and says, wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Anybody that has toddlers that have been playing in the mud knows you can't send the toddlers into the bathroom and say, make yourself clean. Any more than a pile of dirt could turn itself into a pile of pearls. Dirty things cannot clean themselves and make themselves clean. Our sin makes us dirty and filthy before God. We cannot clean ourselves up. God's not taunting them. He's not mocking them, I don't believe. I think he's communicating the reality. He's saying, Clean yourself up, wash yourself, and make yourself clean. Oh, wait, you can't. And you can't because that's not the plan. There's no amount of human effort that can ever reconcile sinners to a holy God. No amount of human effort. My best nanosecond of my life, you take down my best second, you break it down within that second to my best nanosecond that I've ever lived. If that nanosecond of goodness within me was every moment of my life, I'm still not good enough to stand before God on my own merit. I am still a sinner in need of a Savior. I am still a sinner who deserves wrath and in desperate need of grace. Do you understand we cannot be good enough? Simply can't be good enough. So, so far, it's been all bad news all the time. Big problem with big consequences. And thus far, there's been no hope. But here's what I want you to hear as we start this. As we start this book of prophecy, this ancient writing to a broken, sinful people. As, I, as we do this, here's what I want you to understand, why we're slowing down so much on the bad news. Here it is. We must fully understand the bad news before we can ever fully grasp the good news of Jesus. If we don't understand why we need a Savior, why is the cross beautiful? If we don't understand why we need a Savior, actually the cross looks gratuitous and gory and unnecessary. 
But if we understand the messy nature of sinners in need of a Savior, we look to the cross and go, that makes perfect sense. Why? Because the bad news is what makes the good news so good. I cannot stand before God on my own, but by God's grace, I don't have to. He made a way where there was no way. So before we even finish chapter 1 of this ancient book, of Isaiah, this ancient book of prophecy that starts from the problem and leans into it heavily like we have this morning, being faithful to the text before we even leave chapter one. If we stop today and I said, all right, let's pray, let's go home, let's eat, let's watch football, we'd be like, that was heavy. It didn't leave us a lot of hope today. And if this is where we stopped, if this is the end of the human story, there is no reason to have hope. But before we even leave chapter one, something beautiful is communicated from God Through Isaiah to God's people, look at verse 18. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. God looks at his people and he says, guys, let's reason together. I've provided for you. I've protected you. I've done everything I could possibly do to communicate not only that you need me, but I've been there to meet those needs. Not only that I love you, but I love you in spite of you. I've done everything I could possibly do. I've done everything I could do to love you, to provide for you. And you, Israel, my people, my children, you have done everything possible to hate me and provoke me. God is saying to his people here in this passage, you deserve my wrath. But if you will repent, and if you will run back home to me, I can make a way to make things right. As right here in chapter one of this ancient book, it's all about sin and the problems, the problem at the heart of humanity. In the midst of all that, the good news of Jesus is foretold before we even leave the first chapter. He told them, your, your sin, it stains you beyond repair, but I, through my plan, can wash you whiter than snow. This is God giving Isaiah a glimpse of Jesus the perfect son of God who would be the perfect sacrifice to pay the price that we couldn't pay, that we could now stand before God, not covered in our stains of our sin, but covered and clothed in the righteousness, the perfection of Jesus. If I had to stand before God because of my best moments, there would be stains of sin all over me because my best is not good enough. But because of what Jesus will accomplish on the cross, foretold 750 years before Jesus ever was born, he's still existing in eternity before he ever stepped into creation. God says, I'm going to make a way where there was no way to wash you in his blood, to cleanse you so that when you stand before your creator, no longer are you utterly estranged. You are utterly and completely and totally loved and embraced because you've been covered by the blood of Jesus. We started today with this idea of knowing the outcome changes our outlook. And I believe that it's true, but it's not why we're covering this book. Here's what I want you to understand. You know, Back to the Future? Sorry, quick quick transition there, right? You know, Back to the Future? Biff gets the sports almanac and travels back in time, gives it to his younger self, and Biff gets rich because he knows the outcome of all the games. Sometimes we look at prophecy, and we want to know the final score so that we can navigate life a lot easier. That's what we want to treat prophecy as, but that is not the point of these books. God does know how the story is going to end, and there's things we can know from the book of Revelation about how this whole story wraps up, from the book of Daniel, how this whole, how this whole story of God uh, wraps up, but that's not why we're studying this book, and that's really not why we should study prophecy. What I want us to see in all of this is this, is that what we need from this is knowing the one who knows the outcome changes our outlook. See how that's completely different? It's not just about us knowing the final scores. It's about us knowing the one who holds every game and every struggle, every storm and every joy. He holds them all in the palm of his hand. He knows how they all work out for our good and for his glory. Knowing him is how our outlook changed. Knowing him and seeing his holiness lets us see our sinfulness. Knowing him and our great need lets us see him and his great love. Knowing the despair of our estrangement from God helps us understand the delight of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Over the next few weeks, we are going to walk through a book that was written 750 years before the silent night when the the angels sang. 
750 years before Jesus was ever born. And my prayer is that as we go through this series, that God will radically change the way we see him. That God will radically change the way we see his world. And that God will radically change the way we see our part in his plan. Knowing the one who knows the outcome changes our outlook. But it begins with where we began today, understanding and seeing our sin the same way God sees it. Seeing our God as the one who not only holds the future and know how it all works out, who's not just big enough to hold the universe in the palm of his hand and to call the stars out by name each night, but he's also close enough to catch our tears in the bottle and to know everything we've gone through. And he can see every way we have lived on that sin spiral, taking one tiny step at a time toward ruin. And in spite of all that, he reaches out to us with the opportunity to be washed whiter than snow through Jesus Christ. And to not just be washed whiter than snow, to go back and do the exact same thing, but to have our lives radically changed, where our lives are all about knowing the one who saved us and making him known to our neighbors and the nations. That's why we're studying the book of Isaiah. And I look forward to doing it over the next few weeks with you. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for your word, for the hope that we have in Christ, for the bad news of our sin, but the good news that Jesus paid the price. Lord, if there's anybody joining us in person or online this morning who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, not waved the white flag of surrender, they're hearing a tugging, or feeling a tugging on their heart and hearing your call to salvation today. Lord, let them wave that white flag and say, it's God, Father, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus paid my price. I trust in him. I lay down my life for him. Save me, clean me, and use me. Lord, if we're maybe people here in this room joining us in person or here online, Lord, I pray you would help those of us who've been saved for a long time but become tolerant of that sin spiral, content to let the world push us to a certain extent, but Lord, to let our flesh and the enemy convince us that what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. Lord, forgive us for how we have tolerated sin in our lives and in our midst. Let us be a people who stand strong on your word with the love that you have shown us, displaying that to a lost world, but with a firmness of conviction that it is the sin of humanity that nailed the Son of God to a tree. And let us never, never be comfortable with what cost Jesus his life. Let us never be comfortable with what Jesus suffered and died. Let us never be comfortable with what drove him into the empty tomb because, praise God, he did not stay there. On the third day he rose and he sits at the hand of the Father, interceding for the saints. Lord, let us see you as you want us to see you. Let us see ourselves as you see us, first off as sinners, but then as sons and daughters of the King if we are in Christ. Lord, let us, through this book, see the good news, not just foretold. Let us see the good news alive and well in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.